series and uh, going to put it up on YouTube and on Facebook. Check your email for a link to the YouTube and uh, we'll see how it goes. I've been playing with this this morning, trying to get the sound better. Uh, we're going to do things where we're, hopefully we can get the high def camera to go straight off the sound system and that will take some things out and help the sound. Be patient with us. We're going to do our best. Let's have a word of prayer and dig into God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you so very, very, very much for the day. We thank you, Lord, that we can get together, uh, even if it's uh, only through technology. We pray, Lord, that you be with each and every one of our church folks and their difficulties, those that have lost jobs and those that may, those who hours, whose hours have been cut back. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would uh, be at work in our lives uh, for our good and for the furtherance of your gospel. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit within the comfort and the guide. We thank you, Lord, for our church family and for the way they've been stepping up already for one another. We pray, Lord, that you would bless our time in your word and that you would open our hearts to it, that you would uh, free us from the distractions of this world and focus our hearts upon you, upon your word, and upon your will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So be patient. This is completely new. I've never preached to an empty room before. Um, my father used to preach to an empty room every Sunday morning. Uh, he would uh, get into the auditorium to do a radio broadcast, and he always did it from the pulpit because it's what felt right, and he did it to empty pews. I found out the hard way, never, ever, ever look through the window and make faces at your father while he's preaching to empty pews. Uh, I learned to regret that. Uh, the Lord has a sense of humor, and uh, if you don't believe that, well, just look up the duck bill platypus and um, tell me what you think afterwards. Uh, but uh, you know we've been preaching through the book of Romans in our passage for today, as the Lord willed it long ago, is Romans chapter 13 and verse 1. Uh, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, talks about the Christian and civil authority. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to look at that and uh, look at the first seven verses together this morning. We're going to make application to our immediate situation, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our approach as a church practically, uh, what we can do for each other, what we are doing for each other, and uh, how we can better do that. Romans chapter 13, beginning of verse 1, uh, reads as follows. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no, no authority except from God, and those which, are, those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath, on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Romans chapter 1 and verses 1 through 7 tells us what we're to do in regard to civil authority and why we're supposed to do it. Now, first of all, we are to submit ourselves to the governing of authorities. We are to obey the rule of law. Uh, the word submit means to place under. It means to place under in an orderly fashion. God has ordained authority in our lives. He has ordained authority in the home. He has ordained authority in the workplace. He has ordained authority in terms of governance. Uh, God has a pattern of authority in every aspect of our lives. If we go against those in authority over us, we're going against God because he appointed them to what they're doing. Uh, <clears throat> we are to submit ourselves to the governing authorities. It's literally the higher powers or the higher authorities, those that have rule over us in any sense. And it seems especially true here of civil government in this passage, and certainly of civil government in our present situation. Uh, we are to submit. We're also to pay our taxes. You'll forgive me. I'm looking at this a little bit differently today, not necessarily verse by verse, uh, but looking at it in terms of what we do and why we do it. 
And so uh, taking the verses just a little out of order, you'll forgive us that this morning, uh, but we're to pay our taxes. Um, that's a hard decision to make sometimes. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Until they catch you, and then it's not such a hard decision to make. Uh, but uh, there are things that our government funds that we don't love. Uh, I am reminded of a man in North Conway, New Hampshire, who was instrumental in starting First Baptist Church, Thomas Densmore. Uh, he wrote to the town of North Conway, objecting that his taxes were going to the Congregational Church, and that by conviction he was a Baptist. And so he told them he had no intention of paying taxes so long as his, he had no problem paying them, but he had no intention of paying them as long as a portion of his taxes went to support a church with whom he didn't agree. Uh, their, situa or their solution to the situation was to give him a receipt and demonstrate to him that his taxes were used on road projects. And uh, so that clever governance that got the job done. And praise the Lord for separation of church and state in our current day and age. Luke chapter 20 includes a time where the scribes and the Pharisees came to Jesus and they were trying to trip him up. They were asking him questions uh, that had, to their thinking, no good answer. Uh, famously, they asked about it, a lady that married a man and he died, and by law, God's law, she married his brother and he died, and she ended up marrying all of his brothers, and they all died, and then she died, and the question was, in the kingdom, whose bride will she be? And the Lord said, you don't know what you're talking about, because if you did, you know in the kingdom they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels. And uh, they tried to trip him up about whether one is to pay taxes to Caesar or not. Stop and think about that. Rome is in charge. Rome has conquered Israel. And so all of the people that are there are under the thumb of Rome. The governors of Israel, King Herod, etc. They were puppet governors of Rome. And so the Israelites, they were proud people. They didn't like to admit that they had been found, uh, that they had been subjugated by anybody. They didn't admit to being slaves. They didn't admit to being conquered. And so they revolted and often. And so they thought they had Jesus because if he said don't pay tax to Caesar, well then Rome would be upset with them. They could get rid of him that way. And if he said don't pay or uh, go ahead and pay it, well then the Jews would be upset with him because he's siding with Rome and nobody wants him to do that. And of course his answer was bring me a coin, bring me a denarius. And he says whose picture is that? And whose name is, is underneath it? And of course they answered that Caesar. He says, okay, we'll render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and to God that which is God's. And so in that parallel passage, we see clearly we have a responsibility to pay our taxes. Uh, we are to give honor and respect to all of those to whom it is due. Uh, we need to respect the office. Whether the person holding the office can be terribly rude on Twitter, or whether the person holding the office gave $150 billion to someone who, a country that is our sworn enemy, uh, no matter the case, we call them sir, we refer to them by their office, and we give them the honor that that office is due. We respect the office, no matter who's within it. Whether we agree with them or don't agree with them, appreciate them or don't appreciate them, we have no choice. We are under God. We honor the civil government because God has placed them where they are. Back in our passage in, first, or in Romans chapter 13, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. There is no, no authority except from God. Uh, and those which exist are established by God. Just an aside, this is so much harder than preaching to people in the pews. Please bear with me. I have been so tempted to stop this and restart it so many times already. We'll see how we do. So we are to give honor and respect to governing authorities. We are to pay our taxes as they're due. Uh, why are we to do it? Verse 2, therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Verse 3, for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. So part of the reason that we obey is because of the power behind the throne. God established human government, so this, to disobey human law is to disobey God. And so it makes it very clear. That shows up in the home. Uh, wives are encouraged to submit to their own husbands as unto the Lord. 
Uh, it is not a matter of do you have the ideal husband, none of you do, uh, but are you honoring the Lord in how you honor your husband? It's the same in terms of civil government. God has put them there, and so it's our job to honor them because it is God's authority that has been passed along to others. Also because of the punishment from the throne. God has decreed that lawbreakers should be punished by those representing human government. You see, the laws are only good in so far as and in so much as they are enforced. And so that's God's intention as well. <clears throat> my heart used to catch in my throat every time I drove past the policeman. That might be because I had quite a heavy foot as a young man, and I was rather careless. I paid more than my share of speeding ticket fines. And so when seeing the trooper on the side of the highway or the local policeman on the side of the road, my heart would go into my throat. Uh, I would get physically ill. Whether I was speeding or not, it was kind of engraved in me. Uh, call it Pavlovian, I don't know. I found that got a lot better after many years of being careful with the speed, not going so far over it has to be an issue, and uh, being very careful uh, to drive safely and to obey those traffic laws and all of those speed limit signs. Incidentally, all the marked speed limits in Massachusetts are too low. I'm just saying. Uh, another place that this came very real to me was when I was a much younger man. Uh, in elementary school, I had the same teacher for fourth grade, and then for fifth grade, and then for sixth grade. Miss Linda Hamilton, she was the terror of my young life. In our small Christian school, we got spanked for not doing our homework. She spanked me for not doing my homework. Dumbest words to ever come out of my mouth was when I got in the car one day to go home with my dad and told him that Miss Hamilton spanked me and that it did not hurt. So I got one when I got home that did hurt and then drove home the message. And somehow the word got back to Miss Hamilton and she got Mr. Sugimura, one of the high school teachers, to be her designated hitter. He wasn't a very large man, but he knew how to concentrate his energy, and I kid you not, he grunted with each swat, and he about knocked me on my nose, and I was never late with my homework again. I found that Miss Hamilton kept me up nights, probably was working on a juvenile ulcer, uh, and all the worry I had about having things done for her, or what I didn't have done for her, or how mean she could be in class. And you know what I found to be true? If I paid attention, I had no problem from her at all. If I did my work, I had no problem from her at all. If I did my best, not only did I have no issue with her, I got praise from her. It turns out she was actually quite fair. She just wanted us to do our very best and to do it as under the Lord. And so if you don't want to have fear of the governing authorities, this passage tells us, obey them. And uh, that obedience as itself will take away that fear. There are greater questions. Uh, many of our forefathers were Christian men. Our forefathers who revolted against England were Christian men. They felt that there was a time uh, that called for revolution. Uh, that's a question for another day. Our question is about the here and the now, and do we obey civil authority, and why do we obey civil authority? We obey them because God put them in power. We obey them because with the power and authority they have, they have the right and the obligation to punish us for not being obedient. And so we see God's word comes right to it. Verse 5, therefore it is necessary to be in subjection not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. We want our conscience to be right before God. And with our conscience right before God, uh, for our conscience to be right before God, we need to obey civil authority and give them the respect and the honor that they're due. Uh, rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Uh, if you don't learn to respect other authority, you're in grave danger. Kim and I, when we were first getting involved in ministry in our first local church as a married couple, uh, first they gave us the twos and threes class to teach on Wednesday nights, and then we graduated uh, to teaching the primary first to third grade Sunday school. We had some boys that were in that Sunday school class that were homeschooled back when very few people homeschooled. And 
and uh, their parents were very faithful people at church. They were very talented people. But in their world, they did not have to obey anybody other than their parents. They did not learn to respect or to honor the authority of anybody outside their parents. And that included their primary Sunday school teachers. It made it rather nightmarish to teach them. Uh, as an aside, dear homeschool parents, be thinking that way. Uh, make sure your children understand that there are others that have authority and that they're to be obeyed same as you. Back in the day when my parents would drop us off with a babysitter, the babysitter always had their uh, last words were typically, hey, if the boy needs spanking, spank him. I never liked those words. I can't remember a babysitter ever spanking me. But more than once, my brother and I got in trouble when we got home because as they needed to, the babysitter, well, pulled on us, and that's how things work. We need to impress upon our young people a respect for authority, for the police, for governing authority, for their teachers, for their administrators, uh, for their teachers at church, and so forth. To make sure they understand and honor, to give on to those to whom it is due. <coughs> Excuse me, we need to talk a little bit this morning about our current situation and uh, what the government is asking of us, what we're doing about it, why we're doing it, and so forth. Um, we are bound by Romans 13. Again, God's perfect sense of humor uh, to have this be our passage for the day. We are bound by Romans 13 to be obedient to man's law. We are bound by conscience and covenant to function as a local church in any way that we can. And so what do we do with that? Uh, we as a church are actively trying to take advantage of the situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, we are in a unique situation. It's unique to our lifetimes, to every last one of us. And uh, with unique situations come unique challenges, but also unique opportunities. And we need to look at it that way. Uh, we are trying uh, to establish a greater online presence and online influence. Uh, God had already started us in this direction. And uh, we need to get better at it. Uh, I pray that the quality of recordings this morning are such that it's not a distraction to you. Uh, it sounds a little better than my trial ones were. And uh, we'll keep working on that. So we need to do what we can from afar to keep the Word of God in front of each other, to encourage one another, uh, and to lift everybody up before the Lord in prayer, and to take care of each other in things physical and financial as best we can. Uh, it's a reaffirmation that the church has never been a building. Uh, we have a beautiful building here. Uh, we have a number of folks still in our church who are part of building this building. They take great pride and great delight in it, and they really should. It's a beautiful building, and it was a unique and very special time in the history of this church to build a building together. But this church is infinitely more than this building. I want you to know I'm not careless with a word like, word like infinite. Uh, infinite really is a word that mostly applies to God, but it also applies to what God is doing. The church is a body of believers that are indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. That is infinitely more than brick and mortar, uh, lap and plaster. It is so much more than a building. We need to have a great commitment to reach out to each other and to care for one. Uh, we need to look for opportunities to care for our folks. Our number of shut-ins has increased exponentially uh, in these last weeks, and it's only just begun. We have a greater commitment to use technology for a witness to the world and to, for the spiritual growth of the saints. Uh, we're emailing and doing Facebook devotionals, are or are going to be. Uh, we've established a YouTube channel for Pilgrim. Hopefully you found it this morning. Uh, I think that's probably the best place to watch. Uh, we're sending an email with that uh, link and uh, letting folks know it's Pilgrim Baptist Church, space N, space Brookfield, space MA, uh, is our channel. Uh, there'll be a link to get you there. You should be able to Google us and find us that way. Uh, we're talking about an FM transmitter. That would allow us to do a drive-in service. Uh, the church my dad pastored for almost 30 years in western New York. Uh, is probably five or ten years older than this church is all. And in their early days, in the late 60s, early 70s, as they were just building their building, uh, on summer Sunday evenings, they had a drive-in service. To be honest, for them, it was kind of a novelty. 
and uh, just having fun on a pleasant Sunday evening. Folks would sit in the bed of their pickups, on lawn chairs, on the hood of their cars, etc. A great place to show off your convertible. Uh, I love seeing old pictures of them doing that and having fun with them. A number of people in our country are doing that now. Uh, it's something we can do here, uh, as simple as uh, picking up a $115 FM transmitter and doing that. Let me know what you think of it. Uh, give us feedback on how we can do this better. Uh, many of you are better at technology than I, uh, and, and even than those that are helping me with this. Speak up. Uh, in your notes that are emailed to you is my personal email and my cell phone number. Text me, email me, call me. Uh, let's talk about how we can do this better. What's our approach? That's our attitude as a local church. And then we got into approach a little bit. But really, what's our approach as a local church to this current pandemic and all that it brings with us? With it, Well, first is obedience to both the spirit and the letter of legitimate law. Spirit and letter. Uh, for me, typically talking about the spirit and letter of the law, the letter of the law is 30 miles an hour. The spirit of the law is if you're not driving 35, even the police are not happy behind you. Letter and spirit, you can debate that and your conscience can guide you in that. Uh, here, the spirit of the law is we don't want people to get sick. We don't want to be people that are passing along this virus to those that might be very much at risk from it. And the letter of the law is right now in writing in Massachusetts, no groups of greater than 25, no gatherings of greater than 25. So what have we done? We've suspended every meeting except for a meeting. And we still had a work day yesterday, Saturday. We had a great work day yesterday. There were more than 10 people. There were less than 25. We were all coming and going, and therefore not a gathering, according to printed Massachusetts guidelines. It was important to us to obey both the spirit and the letter of the law. We had prayer meeting Thursday night. We intend to have it again. We had exactly 10 people, and we practiced our social distancing, like good citizen Christians uh, who don't want to get each other sick. It was a delight to pray together and to see one another. The spirit of the law, be careful not to spread the virus, and we're suspending both large and small meetings that would run that risk. Some of our meetings are smaller, but we're naturally closer together in smaller rooms. Uh, we're foregoing those for the present uh, in the hopes of letting, you know, flattening the curve, as you've all learned in these past couple of weeks. Uh, personally, I've become more convinced as time has gone by that we're facing a legitimate health threat and that limiting our exposure is necessary. We need to think that way, and a number of our folks are at great risk, and they absolutely need to think that way. There have been times when Christians have had to choose between obeying God and obeying man. In Acts chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, Peter and John went before the Sanhedrin council, verse 18, and when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. There will come a day when the government will tell the Christians that remain on this planet that they can't practice their Christianity openly, that they can't share the gospel, that they can't treat, preach the truth of God's word. We're not at that day. There are times when we have to obey God rather than man. This is not one of those times. Our requirement right now is to be creative, to be thoughtful, to be obedient, and to do our best to function as a church in every sense, sharing the word of God, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, caring for the needs of the saints, doing all of that the very best we can in our present situation. That's our approach as a local church. What about our attitude as individuals? James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my beloved brethren, when you call, fall into various kinds of trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience or works endurance. God has a purpose for this. God has a purpose for everything that he allows in our life, no matter how large or how small. And we need to take him at his word, and we need to strive to see what he's trying to do in us, and what he's trying to do for us. We need to see this as coming at the allowance of an almighty, all-knowing God of perfect love. 
To say that Satan is winning or that God isn't able to stop this is to serve an impotent God. I've heard people say, boy, Satan sure is winning. So many people are sick. Satan sure is winning. People aren't in church this morning. And these empty pews are the weirdest thing I've ever stood in front of to preach, I'll tell you. Um, but to say that Satan is winning is to deny the power and the omnipotent, the omnipotent power and the absolute sovereignty of God. In reality, our omnipotent, all-powerful God has allowed this for our good and for his purpose. Because of that, we need to allow this time to deepen our prayer life and our dependence on God. I pray that you're spending more time in prayer because of the current situation. I pray that you're spending more time in God's Word because of the current situation. I pray that your fellowship, whether it's by technology, by phone, by Facebook, by Twitter, what have you, by mobile phone and text, uh, whatever it is, I pray that your fellowship with one another is sweeter than ever. Uh, we found that yesterday at work day, we found that on Thursday night at prayer meeting, people were particularly glad to see each other and to take encouragement from one another. Um, we need to take this as being from the hand of God. We need to prayerfully ponder what God wants us to do in these times and what he has for us to learn. What is God doing? What does he want us to learn? Stop and think about it. People always gone out and about. We all know that in our present life, we have been far too busy to take care of what matters most. That's been slowed down, hasn't it? Families are in the same house together. They're sorting things out. To be honest, it's probably going to be hard. Some of you haven't talked to each other very long. All we need now is for cell phone service to be interrupted, and we'll actually have to talk to each other in person. Uh, we have opportunities to show God's love like never before. I would like to hear some of the stories already. Some of our people have been giving away hard-to-find necessities to other people. Talk about an open door. And you want to get somebody's attention? Give them a roll of toilet paper or something else they weren't able to find at the store. Some of our folks have taken opportunities to witness by giving people a biblical Christian perspective on all of this. Help people to understand it. The world is not coming to an end. God is still on his throne. God has a plan and a purpose, and his word gives us everything that we need. One of the problems with doing this on my own cell phone is that I couldn't mute it and somebody's calling me. I'm sorry. Uh, our folks have been wonderful about looking out for each other so far. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. We have an opportunity, an unprecedented opportunity to do good to all men, and we need to take particularly good care of our fellow church attenders, those of the household of faith. We need to carefully avoid several things. We need to carefully avoid fear. We need to count on God's attributes. What do we know about God? His power, His presence, His love, His authority, His sovereignty. How about His track record? Has God been faithful to His people up to this point? Has God provided in miraculous ways and astounding ways through the years for His people? He sure has. And His promises, what has He told us? He'll never leave us or forsake us. Uh, he who has begun a good work and he will be faithful to complete it. Take hold of God's promises, God's track record, and God's person, his attributes. Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 to 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear, you are more valuable than many sparrows. 
God knows us so well, he's counted the number of hair on our heads. God knows us so well that he knows about us even more than about the sparrows. He knows when the sparrow falls to the ground, we're worth many, many, many sparrows. We need to avoid fear. We need to avoid selfishness. The fact of the matter is, times like this call for selflessness. We need to look out for one another. We need to look out for other people. We need to take opportunities to help. We need to take opportunities with the gospel. We need to carefully avoid head in the sand disease. Don't miss out on what God has for you to experience and to learn. Wake me when it's over is not the proper response. Dear Christian, do you know how many times we missed the lesson because we just went and hit? Do you know how many times we missed the lesson because we just couldn't wait for it to be over? School is not about the bell ring. School is about learning something. And school keeps going in life, doesn't it? God wants us to learn from this. He wants to deepen us from this. We need to learn our lessons. We need to be paying attention to what he's doing. We need to be careful not to just mindlessly escape uh, this is not the time to spend all of your day in front of Netflix or whatever streaming service of your choice uh, to binge on those things that you love. You can do a little of that, sure, but there are so many so far better ways to spend our time. We need to be careful we don't miss what God has because we've got our head in the sand. Let's talk about practicalities for us as a church family. Don't forget the deacon's fund. The Deacon's Fund is our benevolence fund. People give as they're led of the Lord uh, to help each other. And uh, we keep the spirit of Acts chapter 4 alive that way here. Uh, last year, over $7,000 came and went from the Deacon's Fund. What a delight it was to see God's people help each other. Uh, there's money in it. People are going to need it. If you have a need or you know somebody else with a need, let me know. Let any of our deacons know. Uh, we will help as much as we can when we can. We need to keep up with our giving. Sadly, the bills keep coming, uh, even as the world stands still. As the Lord puts it on your heart, please mail your tithes and offerings to uh, Pilgrim Baptist Church. Don't forget we have a P.O. Box, 185 North, North Brookfield, Mass., 01535. Uh, mail is the simplest thing. Uh, our officers, our financial officers, will count it. There will be two signatures to account for every deposit. And uh, everything goes in the books by the treasurer and double-checked by the auditor. Our folks still do a wonderful job of handling things with good, God-honoring, biblical accountability. Uh, the simplest thing is for you to send that by mail to the church's P.O. box. Please don't forget to help your brothers and sisters by way of the Deacon's Fund. Uh, it's there. You don't have to wait for Communion Sunday. Not sure how we'll handle Communion Sunday. I don't think we'll have Communion uh, for the 1st of April, the way things are going. Uh, but uh, you can send it and put that in the memo that you want this to go to Deacon's Fund or a portion of this check and give the amount to the Deacon's Fund, etc., etc. Please be mindful that some of our folks have lost their jobs already. Many will lose them very shortly. Many are going to have their hours cut back uh, severely. And those of us that have steadier income should consider giving more for the time being in order to offset the reduced giving that many others will be forced into. We need to think that way. Uh, some of our folks will be relatively untouched by this. Many of our folks are really going to have a very hard time. Uh, they're going to have their hours cut back or lose their uh, work completely. We need to be thinking that way and helping each other. Um, we still have a few rolls of this stuff. This is odd-sized toilet paper. You will notice it has virtually no hole in the middle, and it's in the shape of a star. Uh, so uh, it's not used in the typical pull-it-off-the-roll fashion, uh, but we have maybe two dozen rolls of this still. If you know somebody or if you're in desperate need, uh, we have toilet paper here at the church. Uh, but by all means, keep each other in prayer. We've made an up-to-date list of members and regular attenders and split it four ways between the four deacons. Uh, we've encouraged them to call everybody on their list at least every two weeks. Uh, Kim and I have upped our phone time and uh, are spending quite a bit of time on the phone and will be even more. Uh, Kim has been sending a, uh, an email uh, devotional to the ladies. If you're not on the church email list, please let us know and uh, we'll try to get things to you. Uh, be paying attention to the prayer list. Uh, we need to, we don't, we may not, as this week progresses, be able to have prayer meeting. We'll see what happens. Uh, but one way or the other, we need to keep one another in prayer. And the email prayer chain is the simplest way to do that. Uh, so please do keep an eye on it. Keep an eye out for one another. Uh, see what God will do. Uh, please keep one another in prayer. 
Uh, look out for each other. Look for opportunities to serve. Look for opportunities to witness. Uh, let us know if we can help you. Uh, please don't be shy. Please don't be proud. Uh, we're going to need to step up and help one another, and we will do what we can with the resources that we have. Uh, let's pray and give us a word, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for the time in your word. Uh, Lord, time spent apart, but time spent together in a sense because we're before your throne in prayer. We've been before your word to read and see what you have for us. Help us, Lord, uh, to wisely and carefully live in this day. Help us to be obedient to the powers that be and to be model citizen Christians in this lost and dying world. Uh, help us, Lord, to be quick with the gospel. Help us to be quick to help each other when we have a need. Help us to be quick to help others in our world as they have needs and to show Christian love. Opportunities like this are exactly that. They are wonderful opportunities. Lord, we need your help. We need to think outside of our norm. Uh, we need to think creatively, but mostly, Lord, we need to have an open eye and an open ear and strive to serve you in all that we do. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We pray for those in our church that are hurting physically, those that are hurting financially. Lord, that you would care for each one. Uh, help us, Lord, to love and serve you even.